Greetings, saints. It is indeed a privilege and pleasure to come before you on this Lord's Day. Uh, I'm just so grateful for the many blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon me. And I'm grateful that God has allowed me to enter into his rest. And um, there's no better place to be. So if you would pray with me, uh, Father, as we come this day, we do so by faith with thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts. And Father, we just want to thank you for the message of the hour. Our prayer, Lord, is that you would open the eye of our understanding and help us to comprehend, oh God, the heights, the whips, and the depth of our calling in Christ Jesus. Help us to hear and see what the Spirit is saying to the church 
here in 2020. And Father, we thank you for the victory right now. We pray, God, that your word would be hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Our prayer, Lord, is that this word goes forth. It would accomplish that which you sent it forth to do and that it would not return unto you void. And we pray that your word would fall into the good soils of our heart, bringing forth a harvest by faith, some 30, 60, 100 fold increase. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you for the victory. And we rebuke the devourer. Satan, the Lord Jesus, rebuke you. The blood of Jesus is against you. And we command you, devil, take your hands off God's people. Take your hands off their hearing. Take your hands off their seeing. Take your hands off their understanding. Take your hands off their comprehension. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessing, saints. God bless you. Just again, as I said earlier, uh, it's a privilege just to come before you one more time and um, I'm excited about this word uh, for today that the Lord has placed on my heart. And, and I would like to just share with you um, how I got to this particular passage of scripture. Um, I receive a scripture uh, daily from a friend of mine that um, I grew up with. And um, earlier this week, the passage of scripture that... Um, I received from out of the book of Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 14. Now, I, I, I'm familiar with this passage of scriptures, read it many times, but for some reason, uh, earlier in this week, uh, it struck some curiosity in me. So um, I decided to go to my PC and uh, thank God for files and documents and I was able to, uh, you know, I wanted to see what I had said about this particular passage of scripture in the past. And so, you know, I did what I needed to do. And to my surprise, what I discovered was I used these passages of scripture uh, back on the first Sunday in 2008. And uh, so this was our uh, first message of the new year in 2008. And um, what, what I discovered was, and, and, and again the surprise was, uh, that the subject of that message, watch this, was 2008, the year of new beginnings. Now, little did I know at the time that 12 years later, in the year of completion, that we would be launching a new ministry named New Beginning Ministries. Isn't it awesome how God moves and, and, and plants seeds and, and work and do things that we don't even, we're not consciously aware of what God is doing at the time, but God is doing something? And so uh, it, it was just a blessing. And um, God, as I said earlier, knew what he predestined us to be in 2020. But he laid that first seed, that seed was first planted here at the Reconciled Eastern Church of God back in January of 2008. And so, if someone uh, told me last year that we would undertake major renovations and launch a new ministry in the midst of a pandemic, I would have said, no way, Jose. You know, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna be able to do this. But in the flesh, no, I mean, I wasn't prepared to do it. I don't know if we were prepared to do it, but we had no way of knowing that there was a pandemic coming and that things would be shut down, but God did. But we did have plans to do a relaunch. Uh, at that time, we didn't have plans to do a major renovation, but as time progressed, God seemed fit to do both that bless us to undertake a major 
renovation as well as a relaunch. And so we're here today because God has predestined us to be here. And um, I would like to, for us to know that in spite of the difficulties, God made a way and is making a way daily out of no way. And, and so um, as I thought about this thing, I, I uh, consider many times you get advice from leaders in the movement. And my thinking was this, that um, if I had talked to the different leaders, let's say in Anderson and or West Middlesex, and even here in the state about undertaking a major renovation during a pandemic, they all would have said, no, it's not in the best interest of you or your church. And yet God, through his mercy and grace, has given us the ability to undertake the impossible. But saints, we walk by faith and not by sight. And this is what we know, that all things are possible through them who believe in Christ Jesus. So my subject today is simple. In the midst of a pandemic, we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Knowing that without faith is impossible to please God. And we surely desire to please God. Well, um, let's take a look at the word from out of uh, Philippians. But I'd like to start. My first point is this. In the year of completion, from out of new beginnings. And new beginnings began for us back in 2008, although we were not consciously aware of it, but that's when it began because that's when God planted that seed. And he has brought us here to 2020. And you know, the, the 20 is, represents completion. So now we find ourselves in the year of completion, um, entering into new beginnings. Okay, so Psalms 111 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. It all begins with reverence to God. The Proverbs wrote in Proverbs 1 and 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And so again, we just thank God for what he's doing in and through us. Now, if I can just look at the number eight, and, and I just, this is kind of a uh, review from uh, way back in 2008, if you would just uh, allow me to do that. And so eight denotes resurrection, regeneration, a new beginning, or a commencement. The eighth is a new first, hence, the octave in music, color, days of the week, is the number which has to do with the Lord, who rose out of the eighth or a new first day of the week. Jesus was resurrected, hallelujah, in that new beginnings, in that eighth day. Amen, of that week. Well, although there's seven, the eight would have been that next day. So anyway. New birth, new beginnings, the number of new beginnings, we, if again, if we look at it from a biblical perspective, the number of new beginnings, we had eight people on Noah's Ark, and we see that in Second Peter 2 and 5. Um, we see in Scripture, uh, Genesis 17 and 12, where the circumcision was on the eighth day. Um, God made eight covenants with Abraham, and what appears to be the end may really be a new beginning. Every day is a new beginning. Uh, treat it that way. Uh, stay away from what might have been and look forward to what can be. 
every end is a new beginning because when you find yourself at the end of one thing you're ending into the, a beginning of a new thing um, someday is not a day of the week and so we have to get that someday out of our vocabulary Henry Ford said this coming together is a beginning staying together is progress and working together is success and so again we just want to thank God for what he's doing in and through us uh, the second thing I'd like for us to look at or what we call the second point would be this press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus uh, Philippians third chapter verse 12 says not as though I have already obtained either were already perfect but I follow after that which I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ what is that what is the that that Paul was speaking of not as though I had already obtained uh, this is the statement of great believers who never permit themselves to be satisfied with their spiritual attainments. Once you allow yourself to be deceived and being satisfied with where you are in your spiritual growth, you're in trouble. Um, obviously, Paul was satisfied with Jesus Christ. We see that in Philippians 3 and 10. But he was not satisfied with his Christian life. Can you imagine that? A man that was an, as anointed as Paul was, who, who God used as mightily as God used him, not being satisfied with his spiritual life. How much more should we not be satisfied with our spiritual lives and our spiritual walks? Saints, a satisfied dissatisfaction is the first essential to progress in the Christian race. Let me repeat that. A satisfied dissatisfaction. All oh, right. And all that says is that you're satisfied with not being satisfied. Does that make sense? Because you don't want to be satisfied with where you are in your Christian walk because it leads to destruction. So a satisfied dissatisfaction uh, is the first essential to progress in this Christian race. Saints, we must not be satisfied with business as usual or where we are in our walk with him, especially in the midst of this pandemic. We have to shake it off, not being satisfied with where we are and not being satisfied with business as usual. And as I think about that and I've reflected upon it, that's one of the major uh, problems in the Christian church today is we're satisfied going out to services on Sunday giving God an hour and a half or two hours and then go about the rest of the week living how we want to live as opposed to how the scripture is teaching us we should live. And the problem we have, and, and this is not just here at New Beginnings, this is an issue not just in the church of God. This is an issue throughout Christendom that too many Christians are satisfied with just saying that I'm a Christian and going to church. You've heard pastors say this many times, going to church don't save you. And the church doesn't have a heaven or hell to put you in. You must go to Jesus, understanding that you are the church 
So you don't go to the church, you are the church. And wherever you go, you take the kingdom of God with you. Um, our new beginnings must be in our walk with the Lord, seeking to go higher in his heights, deeper in his depths, and growing closer to him. Paul says here in verse 12, not that I have already obtained the Greek word lambano. And it means to take or to take with the hand or to lay hold of any person or thing in order to use it. And so Paul is saying here that I have not already have taken hold of him. All right. He says here, not that I have already obtained. He said not that I've already taken hold of him. He, 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 we need to understand that there's, that, that, that there's, a, there's a higher dimension in serving the Lord. And we want all that God has for us. Paul is saying, I'm saved, but there's more of Christ that I want to lay hold of in order to be more like him. Does that make sense? Uh, Paul goes on to say that, but I follow after. The first verb is press on, and that's in the NRSV, uh, or follow after. And that, and that verb is dioko. And here it means to move rapidly and decisively towards the object. And it goes on to say, it means to hasten, to run, to press on. And the root idea of dioko is to chase. We should be like Paul in chasing after Jesus. We should move rapidly and decisively towards him daily. Paul goes on to say that, if that I may apprehend uh, the second verb that describes Paul's quest for Christ is take hold of, and that's in the NIV, or apprehend, and that's in the King James Version, and to make it my own, which is in the NRSV. Paul presses in so that he might take hold of. He's pressing to take hold of, all right? Now, the, the, again, we're going to look at a Greek word called kata lambano. And so what that means is this. The, the root idea is to lay hold of. Here it means to lay hold of as so to make one's own a win or to have obtained. Um, there is a deliberate play here that Paul is using concerning and talking about taking hold of Christ Jesus. Um, and so we, again, what he was saying is that I want to be able to take hold of Christ so that in my services to him, I can grow closer and be more like him. Therefore, the more I have of Christ, the more I am like him. Um, what I hear Paul saying is this, I want to grab hold of Jesus with the same intensity that he grabbed hold of me. Now, Jesus had to pay a price to grab hold of us and to rescue us from the clutches of sin. Jesus had to give his life in order to grab hold of us. Jesus had to be obedient. Jesus had to suffer. And the scripture teaches in the book of Hebrew, Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. But understand the price that Jesus paid 
in order to grab hold of you. It was not no easy feat. He gave his all in all. In fact, he gave his life in order to grab hold of you, in order to snatch you from up out of the clutches of sin, death, and hell. If Jesus had to die, if Jesus had to deny self in order to take hold of us, then it would appear that if we uh, wanted to be free of sin, and if we wanted to grab hold of him, as Paul is saying in this passage of scripture, not as though I have already obtained, neither am I already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended, all right? So he wants to apprehend. He wants to lay hold of that which has laid hold of him. And so in order to do that, uh, we have to, as believers in Christ Jesus, to grab hold of Christ the way Christ have grabbed hold of us. If we follow the example of Jesus, Jesus died in order to grab hold of us. It's necessary for us to die in order to grab hold of him. And you say, well, pastor, what do you mean die? We've got to die to me, myself, and I. What do you mean we got to die? We got to die to our flesh. We got to die to ourself. We got to die to our self-centeredness. We got to die to the things that are not of God in order to grab hold of more of what God has for us. And you need to know this. God has so much more for you than what you already have. God has so much more for you than what you have already obtained and or apprehended. God has more for you. If you're willing to pay the price to get what God has for you. And we need to, and I'm talking about me, we need to want what God wants for us. We need to desire and thirst after the things that God wants for us. We got to want it for ourselves as bad as God wants us to have it. And the price that God paid in order for us to have what he wants for us is that his son had to die in order for us to become his sons. And if his son had to die in order for us to become his sons, how much more must we die to ourselves in order to become his sons and daughters? In the midst of this pandemic, it's dark. But that don't mean that we lay down. That don't mean that we quit. That means that we stand up. That means that we take action. That means that we become light. That means that we become an example. We become comforters. People are afraid. People are scared. People are believing that the world is coming to an end, and it is. But we have a word, and we need to have that word ready at all times to deliver to those who are in need. Amen, Pastor. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, one thing is a phrase that is important to the Christian life. One thing thou lacketh, Jesus said to the righteous rich young ruler in Mark 10 and 21. One thing is needed, uh, Jesus explained to busy Martha, when she criticized her sister in Luke 10 and 42. One thing I know, exclaimed a man who had received his sight by the power of Christ in John 9 and 25. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I might seek after, testify the psalmist in Psalms 27 and 4. Too many Christians are too involved in too many things. When the secret progress, the secret to progress is to concentrate on the one thing that God has given you to do. Concentrate on that one thing and do it to the best of your ability. Far too many Christians are a jack of all trades and masters of few. We need to slow down. We need to be still and grab hold of faith and specialize, be effective and efficient 
in that one thing that God has for us. Uh, Paul goes on to say, he says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Uh, so forgetting those things which are behind does not suggest an impossible feat of mental and psychological gymnastics by which we try to erase the sins and mistakes of our past. It's not like that. It, it simply means that we break the power of the past by living for the future. We break the power of the past by being effective in the here and now of God. You can't go back and fix anything in your past. In fact, what God has told us, if we go back to Isaiah 43, in verse 18, and he, he says that uh, in order for him to do a new thing, uh, we've got to forget the old thing and to remember the things of old no more. So God is saying in order for us to be able to go forward, in order for us to enter into a new thing, we have to forsake and forget about the old things, the old ways, the customs, the culture, the traditions. Oh, and we thank God for them. They, they brought us to who we are. They're the foundation. But we cannot live in our past successes. We have to live in the power of now moving towards a greater dimension in the kingdom of God that God has predestined for us. Um, what we're talking about, what, what, what it means about as far with Paul is saying, forgetting those things which are behind and straining toward those which is ahead, it means that we die daily to our own self-centeredness. It means that we become more aware of what God wants for us and for us to want what God wants for us. And I've said that earlier. We've got to move to a place where we want what God wants for us. And what God wants for us, he wants us to live free of sin and to walk in obedience. It's not impossible. Christ died to deliver you from sin. And, and I know there's far too many Christians because I used to be one who, who, who have this thinking, which is stinking thinking because you don't know the scripture that says, oh, can't nobody live free of sin. Jesus died to deliver and set you free from sin. And what that means is this. It means that sin does not have to any longer dominate your life. Sin does not any longer have to control your life. And so people use, uh, um, uh, 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 I, can't, I can't do it, or I can't help myself. That's a cop-out. You can do it. You say, well, how can I do it? You do it by faith. Scripture says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do it. You can live free of sin, and you do so by faith. You surrender, you submit, you give it to the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, if you give it to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will deliver you from it. You got to communicate with the Holy Spirit and say, look, Holy Spirit, I don't want to do this no more. This is, not, this is not helping me. I'm not growing because of it. I'm stuck. And as I said earlier, God has so much more for you. And he wants you to move into the dimension of the power of the kingdom that you've never experienced before. Scripture says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost have come upon you. You say, what kind of power? The power to live saved and the power to live free from sin. That's the power. Too many folk want power to be able to heal, deliver, move mountains. No, before you get there, you better learn how to live saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost gives you the power to live that way. But you have to want it and you have to believe it. And I'm here today to reassure you that you can. Listen, saints, we cannot change the past, 
But you can change the meaning of the past. Too many Christians are shackled by regrets of the past. They are trying to run the race, but they keep looking back. No wonder they stumble and fall and get in the way of other Christians. You can't win a race looking back. <laughs> oh my God, I remember, and I hope Demetrius don't get mad at me, but uh, she, 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 was, she loved track, and so we had signed her up for uh, a AAU track, and she had a coach, and so they had a meeting. And so she had ran her first, first race, and it might have been a 440. And um, I mean, Demetrius just could run, man. She could fly. And she was getting it. But you know the mistake she made? She looked back. And when she looked back, she lost it. And I, I remember telling her after the race was over, and I said, dear, you, when you're running, you can't look back. You have to continue to look forward. And so it's the same thing in our Christian walk. We can't look back. We have to continue to look forward. We have to continue to press on to see what the end is going to be like. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, with the song that comes to my heart right now is I'm going on. I'm going on. See, saints, we have to go on. I thank God for those old Church of God songs. Amen. I got to go on. I got to press on because God has something waiting for me. I see a shining light awaiting over there. All right, Pastor. Listen, listen. Uh, the, thing, the things which are behind must be set aside, and the things which are before us must be taken hold of. Amen. Listen. It is possible to have, as I said earlier, but it, it, from a different perspective, it is possible to have dissatis dissatisfaction, devotion, direction, and still lose the race and reward. And that's possible because we're looking back. You can't look back. All right, Paul says here, he says, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press is the same verb translated, I follow after in uh, Philippians 3 and 12. And uh, it carries the idea of intense endeavor. So we have to have an intense endeavor in pressing on. The Greeks use the description as a hunter eagerly pursuing his prey. A man does not uh, become a winning athlete by listening to lectures or watching movies or reading books or even cheering at the games. You, you don't become a winning athlete that way. You become a winning athlete by getting into the game. You become a winning athlete by practice and practice and practice and performance. So by getting in the game and being determined to win, that's how you become a winning athlete. The same zeal that Paul implied uh, employed, I'm sorry, when he pursued the church, which is found here again, Paul says this in Philippians 3 and 6, he displayed in his service to Christ. Paul was adamant in the pursuit of the church. And now he's just as adamant in the pursuit of Christ. His desire was to get rid of all the Christians because the Christians was a threat to his belief system, which was uh, um, Judaism. And now that same energy, that same eagerness, that same diligence that he employed then, now he's employing in his seeking of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Now, think about this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Christians put as much determination into their spiritual life as they do to their golf life, 
their fishing lives or their bowling lives. Amen, Pastor. There are two extremes we have in Christianity. Uh, and the two extremes that we need to avoid. And the first is, I must do it all. And the second is, God must do it all. The first describes the activists. The second uh, involves the quietists. And both are hitting for failure. The quietest is a system of Christian mysticism that requires a withdrawal from the world and renouncing of the individual's will and passive contemplation of God and divine things. We can't have that kind of attitude. There's a phrase that we use, and I use it quite a bit, and it says, let go and let God. But it sounds good. It, it, it's, it's a uh, kind of a clever uh, cliche that we use. But let's, let's take a look at it from a, um, an athletic perspective. What if a quarterback says to his team, he says, okay, man, uh, just let go and let the coach do it all. It's not going to work. On the other hand, no quarterback would say, "Listen to me and forget what the coach said." What the coach says, both are extremes and both are wrong. So we need to understand when we say "let go and let God," we need to understand that we need God in order to be able to let go, because God then, through the Holy Spirit, will then. Re instruct us on what we need to do as far as relinquishing and letting go of the things that we're trying to hold dear and near to our heart that is not helping us to grow. So that says then that we need God in order to be successful even in letting go. And once we learn how we got to depend on God to let go, then we depend on God in order to grow and go. Okay, Pastor, move on. The Christian runner with the spiritual mind realizes that God must work in him if he is going to win the race. God has to work within you. You can't do this by yourself. You can't live saved by yourself. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, and, and I realized this a long time ago, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, i backslide all over the place. Amen. You say, well, why would you say that, Pastor? Because I know me. I know my flesh. I know those thoughts that run through my head. Amen. I have enough sense to know that, that, that without the power and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, I couldn't live, say, one minute, one second. And I've learned to depend on him every step of the way. And, 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 and even today, you know, wherever I go anywhere, when I leave the house, I'm, I'm praying over it. If I, wherever I'm going, I, I done prayed about it. And my prayer, Lord, is, Lord, go with me, go before me, and meet me when I get there. I pray, Lord, keep me in the center of your will and your way. Lord, keep me from falling. Lord, present me faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. Amen. Because, saints, I'm trying to get us to understand, we can't do this by ourselves. We need him. But with him, we then have this ability within us to grow and there's more of Christ for you than what you have right now and be grateful for what you have but understand there's so much more 
that you haven't even began to comprehend and or conceive. And the scripture tells us that Paul says, I have not seen nor have ears heard the things that God has prepared for them in whom he loves. God's got so much more for you. Okay, pastor, bring it, bring it to a close. Okay, so where we are right now is by faith. We're taking the kingdom of God by force. Matthews 11 and 12 says, And from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been carefully advanced and suffered violence, uh, and forceful men laid hold of the violent taking, taking it by force. And from the day of John, that is from the day when John began to preach, it is not known how long it was, but it is known probably more than a year that John was preaching. Jesus says here, it is simply stating a fact. He says, there was a great rush or crowd pressing to hear John. They would go into the wilderness to hear John. Multitudes went out to hear him as if it were about to take the kingdom of heaven by force. All right. And then it says people have been earnest about it. They came pressing to obtain blessings. And so that it appeared as if in their pressing, it, 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 it had the appearance of even being violent. But they, they wanted what John had and what John was talking about concerning the coming of the Messiah. The kingdom of heaven has been subject to violence and violent men attack it, is what Jesus says. What we are seeing today is a violent attack on the truth. Saints, I know that you know what I'm talking about. It saddens my heart to see so many of God's children and believers in Christ Jesus being manipulated and deceived by their pastors and leaders um, and their strong and their, their pastors and leaders and their strong attachment to political parties, political ideologies, and misguided agendas that ignore the truth and work diligently after that truth. It, it baffles my mind how these Christian pastors, evangelists, leaders are following after lies. The scripture teaches that we should know the truth. The truth should set us free. But the church is, the church is in bondage. Here's what I believe. We remember we've been some months back. We we we, we preached uh, from out of the Word of God, where God says, "If my people who are called by my name, if we would one humble ourselves, there's no humility in the church no more. If we would turn from our wicked ways, we don't perceive ourselves as having any wicked ways. If we would seek His face." We're not seeking his face. We have great church services. We got all kind of uh, tricks, schemes, and devices that go on and, and, and all kind of things that get you to come into the church. But we don't have that same type of, 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 of stuff to help you become the church. Now, I, I'm trying to get you to see something here. Here's what I believe. The problem we're having in America today is that the church has chosen not to be the church. And if we want to get rid of racism in America, if we want to get rid of bigotry in America, if we want to get rid of um, prejudice and police brutality in America, it has to start in the church of the living God. If every blood-washed believer, if every Christian 
would repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways and confess their sins, this nation would experience a great revival. Because the problem in America today is too much self-centeredness, too much selfishness, and where does it lay? At It lays in the church. Amen, Pastor. And so the church needs to repent. And when I say the church needs to repent, I'm saying that we need to repent. But if we repent, we're going to hear from God. Now, as I was saying earlier about these pastors and these leaders, they're choosing to perpetuate lies. They're choosing not to look at the truth and expound the truth. They have chosen to follow after the lies. Amen. Listen. Um, I don't know this. For me, in light of where we are politically uh, in this nation, uh, 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 and putting the pandemic aside, this system of thinking within our police departments concerning the taking of black lives is atrocious and it needs to stop. And I tell you, I believe this with all my heart, that it begins with the churches because if the same church leaders would speak up and speak out against this kind of violence in their own cities, in their own neighborhoods, it would put pressure on those in positions of influence to change. But because these church leaders and pastors are not speaking up, and I'm talking about the evangelicals, okay? If the evangelicals, pastors, and leaders are not speaking up and they continue to rubber stamp everything that the president says and does, it's not going to change. It's not going to get better. It's going to continue to get worse. So let me just bring this to a close right now. Um, John says again, uh, John 8 and 32, he says, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I've already talked about it to some degree, but what I have in my notes, what I wrote here is this, the church here in America has been under attack with lies and misleading information that comes from unscrupulous news mediums that specialize in manipulating the truth and boldly displaying lies. And we've come to a place where it's hard to know what to believe because one news medium will say one thing and another one will say something different. And so we must be prayerful saints. And I believe if we stay on bended knees and we continue to pray, we will hear what the Lord would have us to hear. And we'll be able to decipher all the stuff that's being put out there and see the misleading stuff that's being put out there. Um, I know I've been long, but if you would allow me to close with this article I read that was written by Jayusha Dumford. Um, it says, As a proud granddaughter of the man largely credited for beginning the evangelical movement, the late Billy Graham, the past few years have led me to reflect on how much has changed within that movement in America. I have spent my entire life in the church with every big decision guided by my faith, but now I feel homeless. Like so many others, I feel disoriented as I watch the church I have always served 
turn its eyes away from everything it teaches. I feel it every time our president talks about government housing having no place in America's suburbs. Jesus said repeatedly to defend the poor and show kindness and compassion to those in need. Our president continues to perpetuate an us versus them narrative. Yet almost all of our church leaders say nothing. I feel this tug every time our president or his followers speak about the wall designed to keep out the very people scripture tells us to welcome. In Trump's America, refugees are not treated as native born as scripture encourages. Instead, families are separated, held in inconceivable conditions and cast aside as less than. The church honors Trump before God. Trump has gone so far as to brag about his plans, accomplishments, and unholy actions towards the marginalized communities I saw my grandfather love and serve. I now see through the silence of church leaders that these communities are no longer valued by individuals claiming to uphold the values my grandfather taught. A false gospel Trump and the prosperity gospel sell false promises to credulous, gullible, evangelical Christians. God bless you. Father, we pray your blessings upon this word. We pray your anointing upon this word of a thousand times more. And I pray, Father, that this word will serve to comfort, encourage, strengthen, to edify and build up the body of Christ. And I'm asking, Father, that you would bless us indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope and pray that uh, these services in the Word of God have been blessing you. And I know that there are some of you out there that have been um, wanting to bless the ministry. And so we're going to put up some information as to where you could send an offering to sow into this ministry. But know this, we thank God for each and every one of you. And we're asking that you would continue to listen. And if, when you hear the word, the word blesses you, then if you have a Facebook post, post it on your Facebook page. Or call a friend, a family member, or a neighbor, and have them tune in to us on YouTube. And again, I want to say thank you, and God bless you.